In Acts 17 and 27, it says, God did this so they, they would see him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. He is not far from any of you this morning. No matter how far you may think he is, he's right here in our midst this morning. Let's just worship him. The more I seek you. good amen god is good and we're so thankful like i say again for each of you being here we want to give our special speaker brother harper sister harper all the time the lord we don't want to be in a rush that food will set okay the food will set we want him to have his liberty in the lord whatever he has on his heart share teach sing shout dance run whatever they want to do we want to give their liberty to the original overseer of michigan indiana wisconsin and illinois so next door neighbors to us there a little bit but uh, he has a uh, heavy workload and he loves the lord i know he does it would be doing what he does but we want to give them the ample time we'll give them a hand clap if you will
Good morning, Heartland Harvest. It is so good to be here today. Thank you so much for the invitation and the kindness, uh, both from your pastor and Janet Miller and all that we have spoken with throughout uh, the scheduling process. And so I, I just want to give honor to uh, Pastor Crumley and his wife, uh, Melissa, for their leadership here. And uh, Bishop and Sister Allen, it was worth the drive here just to hear you sing. Oh, wow. Wow, that, that was a treat that I will not soon forget. In fact, I, I videoed it so Mom will see it. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it is our treat to be here with you. Thank you, Pastor, for sharing your pulpit this morning. My, um, my parents came here at the ripe age of 23, dad was 23, and mom was 18, and this was their first church in 1958 they came here. Um, mom was pregnant with my older sister, Sarah, and um, by the time I came along, they had moved to Kentucky. But uh, I can remember Dad saying often, Dad was born in a log cabin in Mississippi County, Missouri. I'm not exactly sure where that is, but I'm sure some of you know. Um, in fact, there were a lot of Harpers in the Bertrand and Sykeston and Chaffee area. I can remember as a kid coming to Missouri to, to visit. But Dad spoke fondly about being Missouri born. In fact, Dad would say it's the show me state. And he wasn't stubborn, but you had to show him uh, if he was to believe it. And we called him stubborn, but uh, you had to show him. And he and my sister, my older sister Sarah, they share being Missouri born. And uh, Dad loved that heritage of being born in Missouri. He was raised in Kentucky but he was born in Missouri. Before Dad went home to be with the Lord in January of 2014, he had been battling cancer for about five years. And uh, before he went home to be with the Lord, Dad, uh, that last year of his life, he wrote handwritten a, 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 an autobiography uh, of over 300 pages. And about 20 to 25 of those pages are dedicated to his first church in Sykeston. So I thought before I went to the Word today, I would share just a few snippets from that, uh, if I might. He, uh, he writes on page 109 that um, the church's state headquarters was located at Van Buren, Missouri, and they had suffered a tornado that had come through and, and uh, exacted a lot of damage. They were in the process of repairing the campground and building a new tabernacle. Now, this was before Dad came to Missouri to pastor, and he, he and Mom had been uh, holding revivals in Missouri quite often. And he said, work started at 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, all of the concrete had to be mixed in a mixture by hand. And uh, he talks about that. Bishop Boyd Thornton was the state overseer at that point. And uh, Bishop Thornton um, contacted him or came up to him and talked with him about coming to Missouri to pastor. Uh, Someone mentioned Brother Gardner this morning. Brother Gardner, he writes, and this is in his word, words, Brother Gardner was one of the great ministers in preaching on the church. He was one of my mentors, and I love to sit and talk to him about the church. Um, I'm just trying to give you a few snippets from, from this. He says, after the state convention was over, he returned to Morganfield to finalize plans to move to Sykeston, Missouri. In Uniontown, Kentucky, there was a man by the name of Raymond Turner 
that had several trucks for hauling grain and cattle. He did a lot of hauling for Dad. My grandfather was a farmer. So I contacted him about moving what little furniture we had to Sykeston. He agreed, so we loaded our belongings on the farm truck, which didn't take up over half of the bed of the truck, if that much. And off we went to Missouri. This was a big move for us, especially for Margie. That's my mom. She had never lived away from her mother, and this would be a big change for her. We really didn't know what to expect when we got to Sykeston. We had never seen the church property and did not know any of the members. The church and parsonage were all in the same building. There was a large sanctuary, Sunday school rooms at the front and in the back of the church, entrance room at the front door and a side door and uh, the right side up near the platform. And the parsonage was in the back of the building and he describes the parsonage. He says it's a good thing that they had some furniture in it because we sure didn't have enough to fill it. He goes on to write, we moved in and Margie placed the furniture like she wanted it. We did not have a refrigerator and there was not one in the parsonage. I really didn't have enough money to buy a new one. There was a used furniture store just a block and a half from the church. So I went to it to check on a refrigerator. They had a small used one that didn't look real good, but said it worked good. I told the owner that I was the incoming pastor at the Church of God of Prophecy. He was a real nice guy and said he would take $9 for it. I told him that I didn't have that much money right now. And he said, how about a dollar down and a dollar a week for eight weeks? I thanked him and bought the refrigerator and we used it for five or six years. We knew very little about pastoring a church, so very green, he writes. I sometimes look back on those days and wonder how we got through those early weeks and months. Of course, God helped us and the members were loving and faithful. My church clerk was Grace Sturgeon and uh, was a great blessing to me as a pastor. She called me her little boy pastor. Also, my brother Laylis Jr. was the pastor at the Bertrand Church and my district overseer, which proved to be a great blessing and help. Since I only had one male member beside me, I would get Junior to come over and help in the business meetings because at that time, I'm glad we're not at that time anymore, but at that time, the women were not to take part in the business procedures. Dad kept meticulous records. Uh, in fact, he has, we have journals of his that are stacked quite high. And I was thinking this morning, I probably, you probably could tell me a date, a Sunday, that of the two years that they were here in Sykeston as your pastor. And if I had the journal with me, I could tell you what sermon he preached that morning and the passage from which he preached and if people were in the altar, he just kept meticulous records. And so I was surprised when I, when I read this in his uh, autobiography. In, in fact, um, Dad and I were so close in his, his passing, even though it's been four years, it's still so tender that uh, I can only read bits and pieces of the autobiography at, at a time. So I had not read uh, all of this about Sykeston before coming here. He says the church's finances was low as you could expect. He said it was a small church when he got here after all of the moving in and moving out and transferring. There were, were about 12 members when he was here. And I think when he left, it had doubled to 24. He said that, that made it uh, that they had no other income at the time when they moved here. He says, the first month I was their pastor, I got $35.01 in tithes. And for the first year, he was paid $599.72. He said, August of 1958 was the first month as pastor, and we were expecting our first child, Sarah, in November. We had no hospital insurance, but was trusting God to help us, and he did. He talks about um, going to the melon patch and picking 
uh, uh, watermelon sports, 50 cents an hour. Um, and he talks about Sister Spivey's husband, uh, Sister Spivey's husband, who used to be a member of the church at one time, began to come back to church while Dad was there. And he got saved to join the church. God was moving on our church with his spirit and things were beginning to happen. Brother Spivey owned a gas station in Sykesville and offered me a job. I took the job as it was close and I wouldn't have to drive to Bertrand. This job didn't pay a whole lot but was long and was long hours. I started off working six days a week, $12 or 12 hours a day for $25 a week. And then it was raised to $30 a week. And Brother Spivey, he writes, let him do most of his Bible study and then sermon preparation in the station during his free time. And he speaks very well of Brother Spivey. This is perhaps the last, well, two more things I'll, I'll mention quickly. He says, I remember in one of our midweek missionary service, this would have been in the spring of 1959, before the service, Margie told me that Sarah needed some milk. Getting off from work at 6 p.m., I only had an hour to get cleaned up, eat supper before church, and I would get the milk after church. I only had one dollar and that was it. No bank account or anything. As they began to pass the offering plate, the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, give the dollar. I said, oh no, Lord. My baby needs milk. Give the dollar was the word from the Lord. I took out my bill forward and gave my last dollar, not knowing where I was going to get the milk for my baby's, the money for my baby's milk. The service was over and I went to the door to shake hands with the people as they left and I shook hands with Brother Herb Arnold. I don't know if anyone here remembers him. Brother Herb Arnold, and he laid something in my hand. I stuck it in my coat pocket without looking at it. When everyone was gone, I reached into my pocket and pulled out a $5 bill. Brother Herb had never done anything like that before and never did again. I said, thank you, Lord. My baby will have milk. I truly believe that if I had not obeyed the Lord in giving the dollar, that Brother Herb would not have given the $5. And Dad says, just can't outgive the Lord. He also writes about um, in his final months here that the CPMA department decided to bring the White Angel Fleet program to Sykeston and we had an airport there and since I was the pastor I was asked to organize and correlate the activities. I went to the mayor of Sykeston. I had never met him and explained to him what we wanted to do and also invite him to take part in the church service which he did. I got permission for the parade downtown and the fly over the plains to drop tracks out, and it took place in September of 1960. So I, I just thought you might enjoy hearing some of uh, that history that Dad wrote about uh, and has become dear to uh, our family as well. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to, to minister this morning. I bring you greetings from my mom. Uh, who's still living in Central City, Kentucky, where mom and dad pastored for 27 years. And uh, mom would have loved to have been here today, but she doesn't travel much. But she told me, I, I stopped and saw her yesterday. She said, what can you tell them for me? And I said, I'll tell them that you, I, you send your greetings. And she said, that's it, you tell them that. So mom sends her greetings today. Would you take your Bibles and stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word this morning? I'm looking at Psalm 124. Psalm 124 as we think about and celebrate 88 years of what God has done here through this church. Psalm 124. This is a Psalm of David. And David pins this psalm like this. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, 
then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. The swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowls. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Thank you, Father, for your word. We rehearse today that indeed our help is in the name of the Lord. We honor your faithfulness all through history, but in particular, we honor your faithfulness to this community, to this church for 88 years. And we know that it's in your name that we've come this far. And we recognize that we will continue forward through the power of your Spirit. Now, anoint me in this congregation, I pray. And it's in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ, that we ask these things. And let the church say amen. Thank you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. The book of the Psalms is perhaps the most loved book of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Believers turn to the Psalms in search of comfort. We turn there for answers and inspiration and direction during the challenging times and seasons of our lives. It is in this book that it is filled with beautiful, free, flowing poetry that pulsates with human emotion, with deep interpersonal struggles, with raw conflict and celebratory praise and even unbridled passion. The Psalms, these 150 Psalms, it was the hymn book of the first century church. Christian believers sang these hymns of faith much like we sang this morning, but they would sing from the Psalms with resolve both during their corporate and their private times of worship. Karl Barth, a, a theologian from the 19th and 20th centuries, points out that it is no accident that of all of the books of the Old Testament, the Psalter has always been found to be the most re relevant. We identify with the words of the psalmist be because in those words, we see our own struggles, we grapple with our own issues of life, and we contemplate the majesty of our God. The Psalms put into words for us the deep emotions that we feel, both the visceral injuries and injustices of others directed toward us, as well as the unresolved questions and conflicts which at times overwhelm us in our journey. Indeed, there are times in our faith journey where we find great solidarity with the psalmist when he declares in Psalm 6 and verse 6, every night I flood my bed with tears, I drench my couch with weeping. If you've walked very long with the Lord, you know what it is to have a heart full of anguish. But there are other times, however, when the refrain of the psalmist finds a resonant voice within us as we contemplate the majesty of our God and we find ourselves exclaiming, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. You see, the Psalms provide a framework for our proclaiming both the awe of God and our frustrations with the past that He sometimes leads us down. The Psalms provide a framework for our celebratory worship and our questions of what appears to be injustices. In the Psalms, we have a context to express both the fulfillment of our dreams and the dashing of those dreams resulting in grief. And in the Psalms, we find our faith that is, and, and trust that is placed in God along with our uncertainty of what the future holds. The Psalms meet us where we live. Hassel Bullock has said the Psalms capture the qualitative essence of man and God and lay them out in juxtaposition, thus revealing the insufficiency of the one, but the all-sufficiency of the other. You see, I believe Bullock expresses the gamut of the Psalms, the hymns of faith collected in this book 
reveal my utter insufficiency and my absolute inadequacy as it points me to the all-sufficiency of the God that I serve. He alone is able for every situation. Oh, hallelujah. This is certainly sentiment of the first stanza of Psalm 124, our hymn for this morning, when the psalmist says, If it had not been for the Lord. If it had not been for the Lord. Indeed, our hope, our strength, our freedom, our resolve, our salvation, our provision, our security, our prosperity, our future, all of that would be to naught if it had not been for God in our lives. There's an old Blue Book hymn. Anybody remember Blue Books? There's an old Blue Book hymn that asks the question, that is pivotal for us this morning and it asks the question where could I go but to the Lord that's what the psalmist is answering for us here this morning we can go no other place except to the Lord if it had not been for the Lord within the hymnal of the Psalms is a particular category of Psalms known as the songs of ascent or the King James Version titles it the songs of degrees they are Psalm 120 through 134 and in these 15 Psalms they were the worship songs that the Jews sang as they made their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship God in the temple you might call these songs for the road or travelers hymns three times each year According to Jewish tradition, on three separate holy feasts, all male Hebrews were required to journey to Jerusalem to worship and to give sacrifice in the temple. And on their way through the countryside and through the villages, these traveling Hebrews would sing these songs as they made their journey to the city of Jerusalem in anticipation of worshiping God you might say these were homecoming hymns. They were coming home. These traveler songs encapsulate the faith and the struggles and the anticipation of worship once they arrived there. As you might imagine, the roads leading into Jerusalem would become quite congested with those who were traveling. On their way, they would meet other Hebrews traveling to Jerusalem and they would make friends and they would renew their acquaintance with old, older friends and it would just swell together as in mass they would travel for homecoming to Jerusalem. Some of you will recall that years ago in this church we used to have an annual homecoming. We would go to a little sleepy town called Cleveland, Tennessee in the Appalachians of Southeast Tennessee. And I can remember as a kid when my family would make that pilgrimage to Cleveland driving down I-65, you would look on the back window of cars as they would pass by because in those days we put church flag decals on the back window and when you saw somebody headed south in the same direction you would do this number and you would honk you didn't even know who they were but you knew they were church folk and you figured they were going to the assembly and there would just be an anticipation and excitement that would kind of enrapture our hearts as we as 20 to 25,000 people would converge on that little sleepy town of Cleveland well I kind of imagine that that's what's going on here as these people were making at the as the Hebrews were making their homecoming to Jerusalem history tells us that the city of Jerusalem had a population at the time of Christ of about 80,000 people but history also tells us that on these feast day, especially Passover, it would swell to about over three million people 
that would invade Jerusalem. I mean, everywhere you look, there were Jews and they were singing songs and they were lifting up the name of the Lord, young and old, rich and poor, tall and short, from the north, the south, the east and the west. They came and they came to worship the Lord and along their journey, they sang the songs of Zion to the Lord. The people of God, the community of faith, we have always been a singing people. You need to listen to Sister Jenna Allen as she says, don't ever lose your song. We have always been a singing people. Within the lyrics of our, uh, and melody of our songs, our faith is expressed. Our devotion is encapsulated as we ourselves identify that we are only sojourners on a spiritual pilgrimage of our home, own. And yes, one day we're going home. And what a time we're going to have over there. Oh, hallelujah. You see, the liturgy of song is part of our spiritual DNA. This reality is witnessed repeatedly throughout the narrative of the Holy Scripture. After the defeat of Pharaoh and his army at the Red Sea, Miriam led the Israelites into a song of victory. And they sang, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. When Judah was surrounded by an enemy coalition force, Jehoshaphat placed the choir on the front line to meet the invading marauders, and they sang, Praise the Lord, for His mercy endures forever. When Mary, the mother of Jesus, was informed by Gabriel that she would conceive and give birth to the Christ child, she erupted in song, and she sang, My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. When Paul and Silas were arrested and beaten and imprisoned and thrown into the dungeon, the Bible said that at midnight they sang praises unto the Lord. Even right now in the throne room of heaven, around the throne of God, the Bible tells us that the seraphim encircle the holy of holy, and they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the Bible says in Revelations 14 and 7 that there will be an eschatological event when all of the redeemed of the Lord come home and the angel choir, they will sit down as the redeemed of the Lord stand up and sing a song that the angels cannot sing. Yes, my friend, we are a people of song. We sing when we're healthy and we sing when we're sick. We sing when we have money and we sing when we're destitute and broke. We sing when our hopes have been fulfilled and we sing when our dreams have been dashed. We sing as we welcome the morning sun and we sing during the midnight hours. We sing in the company of the saints at church on Sunday and we sing alone in the shower on Monday. We sing at the birth of a child, and we sing at the death of a parent. We're just people of song. In the last two weeks that dad was alive, we knew that his time was approaching that outside of a miracle from God, that he would get his reward in just a few days. Dad's body had been emaciated by cancer when he died. He probably didn't weigh over 90 pounds. But he fought the fight. And I, I remember three days after Christmas when I had just been there for Christmas when my sister called me and said, Dad has collapsed. You need to come. We threw everything into the car. He collapsed again in my arms that night. We got him into bed, and he never really got out of bed for the next two weeks. And I can remember as me and my two sisters, Sarah the older and Charmin the younger, I tell them that I'm a rose between two thorns, but I'm really a thorn between two roses. But I can remember during that two weeks as we took care of Dad, we took care of his medical needs, his spiritual needs, his hygienic needs, and what an honor it was to spend those last two weeks at the bedside of my father. And I remember that we were concerned about mom too because mom's whole identity had been 
with dad. I mean, she became a pastor's wife at this church at 18 years old. I mean, that just blows my mind. And, and I remember worrying about her and what this next step for her, this change of life was going to be. Because my mom was, if, if there was ever any woman that was a God called pastor's wife, it was mom. In fact, she still tries to be a pastor's wife at the, at the um, she lives in a, at an assistant uh, living, senior assistant living. She can come and go as she wants, but she's, uh, she's kind of the spiritual uh, protector of that place. And uh, so we, I, I was concerned about her, and one day I was sitting in the living room and I heard a noise off in the other room, off in their bedroom. We had moved Dad into another room. And um, I heard this noise, and I thought, oh, Mom's broken under the pressure, and it sound as, sounded as if she was weeping. And so being the only son, I went to the door to check on mom to console her and when I got there there was a holy aura coming out of that room and I dared not walk in mom wasn't crying mom was singing she was singing to the Lord just in days dad would pass from this life to the next but mom had always filled our home with song and she was not going to let anything, even death, steal her song. In fact, on Sunday morning when Dad, we knew Dad was making his passing, we, we would get up every two hours and, and give him medicine. He had slipped into a coma about 18 hours earlier. And when we, when we got there to give him his medicine, we noticed that his fingers were already uh, fingernails were already turning purple and his feet were cold and so we knew it was just a matter of moments and so my sister said do you think we need to get mom up I said absolutely get mom up and for two hours it was the most holiest moment of my 54 years that I've ever lived for two hours we sang and we read scripture around the bedside of dad he was in a coma but his spirit was still alive and well and we read scripture and we talked about all of the people that he was going to make reunion with. He was making homecoming and who he was going to see. And we said, Dad, it's all right. You can go. And we would sing over him and pray over him. That's what I'm talking about, my friend. No matter what life throws your way, be a person of song. In fact, the Bible says, therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. The reality is that the people of faith will not only sing for joy, but we will sing in sorrow. We will sing to the Lord. In fact, in the early days of this Pentecostal movement, it was not uncharacteristic to go to a midweek prayer service and a testimony service to be going on and somebody just stand up and begin to sing to the Lord. I've got a song on my heart that I want to sing and they begin to testify in song. That is the roots of this Pentecostal movement. In fact, sometimes they would just say, anybody got a song to sing tonight? Now, I like the order and I like the structure, but my friend, my point is, never lose your identity. Never lose where you came from. Never lose your understanding and your underpinning that if God had not shown up, I would have no song to sing. So quickly, let me just tell you three things. Number one, this Psalm 124 tells us we need to sing in an attitude of praise, remembering the victories of the past. The psalmist says, if it had not been for God. And then he says, let Israel now say, if it had not been for the Lord, when men rose up against us, they would have swallowed us alive, their wrath. Uh, was kindled against us then the waters would have overwhelmed us the stream would have gone over our soul the swollen waters would have gone over our soul what David is doing here is remembering the Lord's help 
for the last 88 years. I'm contextualizing it a bit, but he's remembering the Lord's help of the past. He ascribes the victories of the past to the divine intervention of Jehovah. And he calls the weary, weary traveler to remember that we are only where we are today by the help of the Lord and by his providential care and assistance. Indeed, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. Can you think about where you would have been 88 years later? if this had not been a church dedicated to the Lord. The psalm begins with a call and response. David is the singer and he invites the congregation to join in. He says, let Israel now say, and then he repeats it. Now if I were preaching in one of my churches in Detroit or Chicago that are Caribbean, I'd say, can I get a witness tonight? That's what he was saying. He says, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, and then David kind of steps into Caribbean shoes. He says, can I get a witness in the house? If it had not been for God, it's the call and response. It's an invitation to pause there for a minute to, to emphasize that if God had not shown up, none of us would be alive today he says in fact think about it a minute he says if God had not shown up verse 3 we would have been swallowed alive verse 5 he says we would have been drowned by swollen floodwaters and my question to you this morning is have you ever felt that way in your walk with the Lord have you ever sensed that you were about to be swallowed alive no, not literally, but metaphorically, spiritually, existentially. It, life is good, you're oriented, you're grounded, but then suddenly disorientation takes over. You feel as if you're about to be consumed, that you're about to be swallowed alive by the troubles and trials of life. One day everything is good, and the next day it seems like all hell has broken loose in your life. One day you're healthy, and the next day the doctor says, we've located a cancerous tumor in your body. And it looks like you have six months to live. That's what David is talking about. Family is well, and then you get a phone call that your son has been injured in a car accident. One day you're employed, the next day you go in, and you find that the plant is shutting down. And Friday's going to be your last day of employment. That's what he's talking about. He says everything feels oriented and then it's all gone. Or perhaps you identify more with the swelling floodwaters that incessantly creep up. You know they were coming, but try as you might, all of the sandbagging that you, you have done will not prevent the inevitable flood that threatens to drown your life and your hopes and your dreams. Last week I was in Mississippi for a funeral and I at the repast, at the, at the wake luncheon, I sat with a gentleman from Houston. They had just come through the Harvey hurricane. And he told me how that the floodwaters came on his property. And he said, there at that point, you could have driven a hundred miles in any direction from Houston. And it was covered with floodwaters. How do you how do you fight 51 inches of rain in four days? You can send back all you want to, but it's coming. And that's what, the, that's what David is talking about. He says there are times in our spiritual life we see the storm approaching. But try as we might, we can't keep it from coming. But we look back and we see that the hand of God delivered us out of it all. Oh, thank God. Somebody in the house knows exactly what I'm talking about this morning. You've been there and you've experienced the sensation of being swallowed alive. You watched the lapping of the floodwaters as they came wave after wave. But you also know what it's like to say, but God showed up at just the right time. And I'm here today because of the grace of God.
we are rearing a generation that need to hear our stories and sing our songs. Oh, I, I love the songs that we sung today. But occasionally, my kids need to sing, Where Could I Go? But to the Lord. My kids need to hear the stories of how there was difficulty and trouble, but God showed up. In fact, you can ask any of the Harper kids today, and they can tell you the story of the dollar for milk and the five dollars that Herb Arnold gave to Dad. Because we've heard that story year after year and sermon after sermon, and we've heard Dad testify about that. His grandkids can recite that story. What am I saying? I'm saying your children, your grandchildren need to hear about when God showed up and how God did a great work in the past. Oh, bless his name. Let me tell you something. I don't want to preach like an overseer this morning because I don't oversee this area. But this is the way I preach at the Great Lakes. I understand everything about our history is not illustrious in this movement. But I will tell you, my friend, there is more right about it than was wrong about it. And we need to tell the stories of the past and not be ashamed of our past. Learn from the mistakes of our past. But there are stories in this church that the Wayne and Jenna Allens and the Arnold Harpers and the Spiveys and the Sturgeons and whomever else you can think about, they need to tell their stories and we need to hear had not God shown up when he did. Well, I've got to hurry. Secondly, the psalmist says, Sing in assurance of power for freedom in the present. After recounting what God, what might have been if God had not shown up, the hymnist David now breaks out into a new stanza of assurance for the power of God in the present. David says, Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us his prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. David sings to the Lord and he blesses the Lord asserting that God hasn't given him over to be consumed by the enemy. But he also points out that God has broken the authority, the snare, the power of the evil one and we are free. That's the word of the Lord. In verses 1 through 5, David compares the opposition of the enemy to being swallowed alive or being drowned in floodwaters. Now, however, the hymn says that a net has been laid for our capture. Much like a trapper lays a snare or spreads a net in order to apprehend a bird. But David goes on to say what the enemy has demised or has, has created for your demise God reverses it and causes you to be victorious. Now we all understand that Satan has a plan for your demise and my demise. He lays traps. He spreads snares. He harasses. We used to live in Michigan. We now live in Indiana. And it's what I call my mini farm. It's only two and a half acres, but I got two barns on that I'm proud of. You see, my grandfather was a farmer, and my dad was going to be a farmer, and then God called him to preach, and so he came to Missouri pastor. But in Kentucky growing up, we, when I was a boy, we farmed a widow lady's farm from that local church in Central City. So it's just kind of in my genes. And I have a garden every year. I've got 35 chickens. 
I call it the Harper Hill. We've got fruit trees. And I remember the first year that we lived there, the blackbirds came and they wanted to eat my pears. Now literally, this is no evangelistic exaggeration. There were probably 500 pears on that pear tree. It was rooted. And I had wonderful thoughts about Karen making pear butter so that in January when it was cold we could put it on hot biscuits for breakfast and have pear butter. But these 50 to 75 blackbirds started swarming my pear tree, testing my sanctification. And so I checked to see what I could do. You know, I've got I'm a hunter too, I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but we'll talk later if it does. My 12 gauge shotgun with my three and a half inch slug that I used to kill turkey with, I thought about blasting some blackbirds with that, but then I would have destroyed my pears and my pear tree. So I checked with people that's supposed to know and they say, well, you can't kill them, but you can harass them. Okay, I can harass these blackbirds. So, I would get in the garage through the side door and here would come 50, 75 blackbirds and they were eating my pears and I would run out like a madman. And I'd go, ah! And they would leave. Five minutes later, here they'd swarm back. So finally the nursery said, get a big net. I got a hundred foot of net and wrapped that tree. I couldn't wrap the whole tree, but if I saved enough pears and I was harassing them and trying to catch them, that's what the enemy wants to do. He harasses, he lays a net to, to, to try to catch you, but the Bible says that the enemy's power has been rendered ineffective for the child of God. Well, thank God. I'm here to declare this morning that I don't care what people have told you about generational curses. The blood of Jesus Christ breaks every bondage. You need to hear that this morning. I, I understand what people say and I understand what Scripture says. Scripture says in, in Exodus 20 that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, Exodus 20 and 6. But you need to read Exodus 20 and 7. He says, but I will show mercy to thousands. I understand that people say, if your daddy and your granddaddy were an alcoholic, that you have to be an alcoholic. I understand what they say, that if their marriage failed, your marriage is going to fail. But I'm here to say that where sin abounds, grace. Grace does much more abound, and He is able to break every chain and render everything ineffective. But I'm going to close with this last point. He says in verse 8, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Do you know there is no hint of hesitation or uncertainty in what David says? The help for the weary traveler is found in the surety of the name of the Lord. He is the creator of heaven and earth who looked out into the chasm of nothing and he brought order out of chaos. He is able to walk into your chaotic life and bring order out of the chaos. In fact, in the first chapter of Genesis, the Bible records some 10 times this phrase, and God said. And God said, and six times the refrain comes back, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. You see, this hymn anticipates that help is on its way. 
we remember the victories of the past. We understand the power of the present. But some of us kind of get uncertain about the assurance of our tomorrows. Let me tell you, the same God that provided my dad $5 when he had given his last dollar is able to provide $500 when you've given your last hundred. Same God. Same God. I like your theme. Same message, different delivery. Is that, is that what it is? God's the same. And there's power for our future. Some people get all upset about tomorrow. Don't get upset. God said, and it was so, blessed be the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The God who is able to speak it into existence. Walter Brueggemann makes this observation. He says, the use of the psalm of trust while still in the pit is an act of profound hope which permits new life. Expressing one's trust in God's sheltering wings is a bold assertion that the power of the pit has been broken. Now notice, he says, you may still be in the pit, but the authority of the pit has been broken. And then I love this sentence. He says, imaginative speech, or I would say words of confident trust in God, may outdistance actual circumstance. You see, what he's actually saying there is that God has given all of us a promissory note. He's given us a promissory word. You may not see it right now. And you may even feel like you're in the pit of bondage right now. But the prophet said, whose report will you believe? And the refrain comes back, we shall believe. Hallelujah, the report of the Lord. It's a promissory word. I may not see it right now, but if God has promised it, it is as good as done. Oh, thank God, I believe that. It's what the theologians call the theological tension of the already, but not yet. The already, but not yet. You see, already... Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but not yet does he reign in full authority from Jerusalem as Revelation says he shall. You with me? I'm going to bring it home if I can. Already, as a child of God, you have eternal life what the scripture says if I had time I would read it to you in first John he says you have eternal life he doesn't say one day you're going to get eternal life he says right now as a blood-bought Christian you have eternal life because my spirit has been born again oh thank God so somebody says well The saint of God, when he dies, he gets eternal life. No. He got eternal life when he came to Christ. Already I have eternal life, but not yet has this mortal body been translated to an immortal body. So this body gets tired. This body gets sick. This body gets older I don't feel like in my brain that I'm 54 in my brain I think I'm 34 
but there are some days that I feel like I'm 64. Especially those long drives to visit one church and it takes 12 hours to drive it. Not yet do I have a new body. I have eternal life, but one of these days, hallelujah, one of these days, what a time that's going to be over there. When this mortal body will put on immortality. Guess I better get up back up here. This mortal body will put on immortality. And so it is the understanding of the tension of the already but the not yet. Now the point I want to make with all of this is some of you have promises from God that you've been trusting, that you've been walking, that you've been singing out for 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 years you've got a prodigal that has left this church and has not come back I'm telling you if you've got a promissory word from the Lord keep holding on it's as good as done you see should the Lord tarry this church has some more chapters to write this church has some more pictures to take to put up on the wall of history this church has some more testimonies to share about the God of the past the God of the present but the God of your future so homecoming is a great day just like the Hebrews they sang all their way and if you don't get anything else from this Kentucky boy that really got his start in Missouri because that's where dad was born. If you don't understand anything else from me, I'll just echo what Jenna Alice said. Don't ever lose your song. Sing all the way. Would you stand over the house? Pastor is coming to lead us into a time of altar response. But I just want to tell you, the God of the past is the God of the present. And He's the God of your future. And if you are here and you feel like you're in bondage today, today is the day to sing your way out of it. I want you to bow your hands right quick, if you will. Nobody looking around. We got food next door, but in a set. But if you've got a need today, this moment, this hour, this minute, Jesus is calling your name. Don't miss this appointment today. If you're here this morning, you need prayer. You might be a visitor this morning. You might not know anybody here. Don't don't let anything hold you back from what God's got for you this morning. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I want you to bow your head this morning. Nobody looking around. Just slide your hand up toward heaven. I need a touch this morning. I need the master to intervene. I need help. The world's crashing. And whatever it may be this morning that you're fighting with, your answer is in Jesus this morning. It's in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we've been talking about old school. <laughs> right? Now we're gonna go old school for a minute. Is that all right? Now we we got time to. I want all the pastors to come up here. Well, all you, come on, we're gonna do something old school here. Remember these old healing lines they used to have? Am I? Hello, somebody. <laughs> Brother Aaron, come on up here. Ask, Brother Arbor, come up here. I just want you to get around here. I know there's just a few of us here. We'll make this two sides here. I know there's at least two people in this place that needs prayer this morning. At least two. There may be more than that. I'm not trying to call nobody out. I promise you I'm not. Back in old days, old school. I always tell them I'm old school, Sister Glenn. I go back in the 80s. <laughs> if it happened in the 80s, I know it. 
song, movie, I don't care what it was, that was my time. But old school in the church, sometimes I used to go, used to have healing lines. And if you need to touch this morning, I'm not trying to embarrass nobody, but I want you to come down here and start on one side and let these men of God pray with you this morning. There's at least two here, maybe more than that. If there's more than that here, I'm not trying to embarrass nobody. We got time. We got time, do or do we not? Well, God's time this morning. Just begin to walk through the land and pray with you this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
other place to go, church. No other place to go. Thank God that we've been here 88 years. Thank God, we, and we want to be here till Jesus comes back. Amen. Through the highs and the lows, the good times, the bad times, the times that looked maybe desperate, and the times that looked like it was overflowing. Amen. Somehow, Sister Margaret, we've been here. Somehow we've been here. We kept the fort. We held it open. And we're going to keep it here till Jesus comes back. Amen. 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 I want you to stay this afternoon. I appreciate again, Brother and Sister Harper, coming. Appreciate his word this morning. Give another hand clap of praise. Appreciate that timely word, that timely word. Let's don't forget where we came from. We've got to have a foundation. Amen. God is for us. Appreciate them being here. All the other visitors, I don't want again, name names. I forget somebody. I know some have a long way to go. Stay if you can. Food's prepared. Stay. We're not going to have a service tonight. We're going to dismiss. So stay as long as you can. Talk to people. Share. Get to know people that maybe you don't know this morning. Maybe some new faces here. Stay for a little while if you can. We want you to stay. Plenty of food here. No service tonight. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I won't be here tonight, so don't look for me. <laughs> I won't be here tonight. Stay this afternoon. Find something over there that you like to eat. We have some great cooks here. I do want to say one thing, and I know time I'm getting away, but I do want to honor Sister Janet uh, Miller for all she's done to prepare this and all the works behind the scenes. She's done an awesome job behind the scenes, organizing things, and uh, she does a lot of stuff around here that goes unnoticed, so I appreciate Sister Janet. Not just her, but I know there's other ones that work behind the scenes, too. We appreciate everybody doing their part. Any quick, quick announcements from anybody? All hearts and minds clear.